As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, how's that for a dramatic start to a sermon? <laughs> Good line for a movie trailer. As some of you may have noticed, I immediately gravitate toward those verses of Scripture that speak of the direct experience of God's presence and the human response of awe and terror. I preach about it a lot. I like that those accounts are both realistic, because terror is the appropriate response, but also profoundly spiritual, transcendent. You know, it's, it's terrifying, but I'm interested. Now, I'm not talking about those experiences of feeling close to God, like when we're out in nature or we see a beautiful sunset. And I don't mean those experiences of feeling close to God through our human relationships. Both wonderful things, but that's not exactly what I mean. I mean those extraordinary experiences of God, when God breaks through in a unique and unusual way. Those biblical accounts of God's presence that are entirely other. To be so close to God's presence that it's described as terrifying darkness in some cases and blinding light in others. Over and over again we read of these responses in the Bible, and most clearly we see it in the Gospel when God's glory or presence or power is being revealed in Jesus Christ. Right? Most recently, two weeks ago, we read about when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured by God's glory on the mountain. Jesus' clothes became a dazzling white. And then the Gospel tells us, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. We see these examples throughout the Gospels, though. Typically, it's when the disciples witness Jesus performing miracles and their response is, tell me I didn't just see what I think I just saw. Right? But, they have seen. And what our Christian tradition teaches us is that once you've seen Christ, you can't unsee Him. You're changed. <coughs> Life is different. And there lies the irony for us. The Bible speaks of the terror and the awe of such a direct and intimate experience of God, and yet that's exactly our journey as Christians. And certainly it's emphasized during Lent. We move toward that unique inbreaking of God in the death and resurrection of Christ. That's our pilgrimage. We seek and move toward the life-changing light in Jesus Christ, toward the transformative light of Christ. As overwhelming and unknown and terrifying as it is, we move in that direction. <coughs> this is our pilgrimage, to know and experience God intimately and directly in the resurrected Christ. <clears throat> the image that we're on a journey that we are pilgrims on a pilgrimage is a wonderful and useful image during Lent. Luke's Gospel lends to this image, more so than the other three Gospels, at least in my opinion it does. In Luke's Gospel as a whole, Jesus is a man with an emphasized sense of purpose and intentionality, a man with direction, and literally, a man with a destination, over and over again. And that destination is Jerusalem. By having Jesus determinately move toward Jerusalem, twice referencing death of prophets in Jerusalem, seeing Jesus in that line of history, Luke is able to center Jesus in the Jewish scriptures. To show that Jesus isn't something new, but deeply rooted in the Jewish narrative. So of course, of course it's in Jerusalem where God's next great salvific act will take place. Of course it's in Jerusalem where God will initiate a renewed and restored relationship with his people. Of course, it's in Jerusalem, where God will break through into human history more intimately and more directly than ever before in the resurrected Christ. Of course, it's in Jerusalem. During 
Lent, we walk with Jesus toward the holy city. We walk on that hard, rocky path towards Jerusalem. And though ultimately we're walking toward Easter joy, first, first we have to journey. And then we have to stand at the foot of the cross. And though we may start, we may start by, some, by simply following the footsteps of Christ. The goal, the goal is for the footsteps of Christ and for our own to not just be in sync, but to be unified. To become one. Where our will is the will of Christ. How's that for another dramatic moment? We have this season of Lent set aside with a particular emphasis on practicing and strengthening and conditioning who we are as disciples of Christ. And we have this season to focus on where we fall short, and how we might cause hurt and harm in the world, not to beat ourselves up, not to awaken to the reality of how terrible and how worthless we are. In fact, it's just the opposite. As pilgrims, much of our pilgrimage is coming to know who we've always been, that we are truly God's children, loved by God beyond comprehension, made in the image of God. The awesome and terrifyingly direct and intimate experience of God in the resurrected Christ is the pinnacle of that for us as Christians. We experience this divine reality when our focus in our lives and our pure, simple love of God in Christ awakens to this divine reality. But we have to be committed to the journey and all that it requires of us. And so, one step at a time, we move toward Jerusalem, reflecting, repenting, refocusing and reorienting our lives with greater devotion to Christ, and in doing so, to experience God more directly and intimately than we ever have before. And so we move, we journey, until we too proclaim, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen.